Thank you, Janet. And Van, thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. I hadn't intended to say anything about that song, but I, I um, was really blessed, and I'm grateful for that. And I, I'll just, may, maybe you know a little bit about where that song comes from. Uh, if you notice, there's only really three lines. Um, and there was a, uh, a singer and folklorist who studied uh, Appalachian music, and um, it was in 1933, he was in Murphy, North Carolina, which is walking distance to Georgia and Tennessee, the far, the far southwestern corner of, of North Carolina. And he happened to be there when there was a traveling group of evangelists, a family that was going through, and they had tried to do some revival there, and, and it really wasn't going very well. Uh, people uh, were getting um, impatient with them. They were doing uh, laundry uh, right there at the square. They were hanging clothes to dry on the Confederate statue, memorial statue that was in the center of town. Um, and so the, the uh, town officials, it was a small town, uh, said, it's time for you to leave. And the father, the traveling evangelist, said, would you let us stay? We just need to raise some money so we can get out of town one more night. And that folklorist was there that one more night. And there was a little girl, I think she was about 10 years old, and the way he describes it, she was as ragged as you could ever imagine um, in her appearance, but in her own way, very lovely, and she got up to sing. And she sang those haunting notes. And afterwards, for a quarter, he got her to sing them again and again and again one time for each quarter <laughs> to add to the money that they would have to get out of town, but also because he wanted to hear those notes over and over again. They had a haunting Appalachian quality to them, and he recorded them, and now they're being used almost a century later. I wonder as I wander. And, and I actually had thought about mentioning that today, but I didn't put it in this message. Um, should have. So I just gave it to you. Um, but uh, because, because really where this message goes is wonder. It ends up in wonder. That's where, the, that's where this message is headed. I actually love the fourth Sunday of uh, Advent. And um, these, these candles are still on even if you can't see them. They're, they're sort of subdued right now. But uh, I love when we get to the fourth Sunday of Advent, it means we have only one more to light, and that's the Christ candle. And that's something beautiful and sacred we'll do uh, as a part of our worship on, on Tuesday evening. You may remember that when we began three Sundays ago and lit the first of the Advent candles, we launched into uh, an Advent theme, Do Not Be Afraid. And we've noticed how the beautiful biblical accounts of the Christmas event, the origins of Christmas, are striped with fear. You see, every time a messenger of the Lord, every time an angel shows up with part of the announcement, it strikes fear in the persons who first hear it or engage them or hear, observe them. And in fact, the beginning of each announcement has a preface, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, we saw three weeks ago. Do not be afraid, Mary. Do not be afraid, Joseph. Zechariah being the father of John the Baptist and a key part of the story of the beginnings of Jesus. And today we, we add the, the fourth and the final stripe to this. It's the angel saying to the shepherds, do not be afraid. In what is perhaps one of the most famous and beloved passages in the New Testament. So listen again. It says, do not be afraid, shepherds. And listen again to Luke chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 8. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you news, good news, 
good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. Let's pray. Oh God, how familiar these words are. And, and here we read them again. And now speak to us in a fresh and exciting way. Come to us, Lord, with your word, your word made flesh. Thank you for the record of Luke. Thank you for all the millions of times this passage has been read, but once more, God, speak to us, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1938, a creative young radio producer and later to be a, a, a movie-making, filmmaking genius, he developed a one-hour CBS radio program that was based on the fictional tale of a Martian landing and invasion. Right, Orson Welles and his cast uh, adapted a 40-year-old English novel into a clever, alarming, and famous broadcast. They made it seem like they were interrupting a dance program with news bulletins and then eyewitness reports. Uh, for 40 continuous minutes, that is without any commercial interruption, the drama escalated as the Martians advanced on a helpless New York City. With the sounds of the city under attack in the background, the broadcast comes to a crackling, chilling silence. Finally, a ham radio operator is heard. 2XUL calling CQ New York. Is there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone? Silence. Nothing. For long seconds over the air. Then the voice of an announcer, an announcer breaks the spell. You are listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater of the Air in an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. The performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, in spite of that message and the one that came right after the intermission, and one at the beginning of the hour and one at the end of the hour, apparently there were many people who only heard the news flashes. There were many who assumed the story was true. And bedlam ensued in parts of New York and New Jersey. The New York Times headlines the next morning read, radio listeners in panic taking war drama as fact. Many flee homes to escape gas raid from Mars. Phone calls swamp police. <laughs> now historians have debated and disputed the extent of the panic. But there's no doubt some responded with hysteria. That's part of the reaction. And CBS faced a backlash for the dread and terror they unleashed. Several weeks ago, we observed that fear is the default wiring of our creaturely brains. It's a primal emotion that goes along with our basic instinct for survival. It's a natural, predictable response to danger, to a threat to our existence. No wonder the radio broadcast triggered a contagion of panic. We are prone to fear. 
In fact, some with their fear-mongering take advantage of our human propensity to expect the worst or to envision what could be coming. And they manipulate our fears for their own purpose or agenda. But not all fears are created equal. That's obvious, isn't it? Not all fears are created equal. Today we hear about existential threats, ominous warnings that uh, something imperils life as we know it. Analysts and pundits use the term clear and present danger to assess threats, and not just in the movies. So we have lots of different ways of trying to figure, is that a clear and present danger? For example, I have no desire to get in front of a moving train. Now, to be in front of that train and on the, cro- on the, on the tracks would be clearly a danger. Right? It would be clearly a danger. Right? It's not a present danger. I really don't live in fear of crossing railroad tracks. But I have a healthy fear of moving trains and not wanting to be too close to them as they go zooming by. Maybe another example would be helpful. You know, if I wake up after a nightmare, I don't have lingering frightfulness. Why? As soon as you wake up, you start to realize, look, there is no clear and present danger in reality. It's just not there. It's not there. Try to assess what's real, what's dangerous. How silly it would be if every time the radio played the Christmas novelty song, Grandma got run over by a reindeer. (laughs) And all grandmothers would become afraid of reindeer. How silly would that be? Fortunately, that song has never produced an epidemic of fear. Just a few laughs and some scorn. Okay, so speaking of the jittery and the scared and the frightful, how about them shepherds? We can't even sing the serene, silent night, holy night without being reminded shepherds quake at the sight. So what kind of faint-hearted men were out in this field keeping watch over their flock by night? Actually, they would have been hardened by the rigors of an outdoor and physical job that most no one else wanted. It wasn't a job that anybody really wanted. They had to climb hills, mountains, to distant pastures. They weathered night chills and fearsome storms. They had to um, face threats to the flock with a rod and a staff, maybe a slingshot. You know, the boyhood shepherd David, before he faced the Philistine giant Goliath, he said that he was equipped to the challenge. Why? Because he had faced lions and bears in defense of lambs. I'm ready for this, he said. You see, a man who was easily frightened when last long as a shepherd, especially in the Judean hills and caves. A year ago, our North Lake pilgrimage to the Holy Land stopped at the traditional site for the Holy Night. And Today, a modern Franciscan chapel um, overlooks the grazing fields. It's on the outskirts of Bethlehem, which itself is a suburb now of Jerusalem. And the chapel is, is erected above a grotto. It's, we had to go down around to see a grotto that was actually used by shepherds for centuries. Today it's equipped with electrical lights (laughs) and seating for small worship services. But when you're inside, you can you you can almost imagine there the the shepherds with some or all of their flock taking refuge in there on um, inclement nights, maybe with a fire out toward the entrance to take off the chill and provide some additional protection if necessary. Now, on the night of Jesus' birth, it was a clear night. The stars were easily seen. 
The sheep would have been out in the open pasture. The dome inside the main chapel uh, on top of that um, place is designed to create a glorious stream of light coming in almost any hour of the daylight. And around the dome, you may see them, are the statuary angels, as well as the Latin inscription for the very famous verse, glory to God in the highest heavens, and on earth peace to humankind and all those whom God favors. And we sat in the chapel and we listened to that scripture being read by a Palestinian Christian. Same passage that we've read from Luke this morning. While he read the scripture, I noticed the four sculpted shepherds at the bottom of the altar at each of the corners. Shepherds kneeling and, and looking up. And then around the back of the chapel are a series of apses or recesses with magnificent paintings to illustrate the scripture passage. All of the artwork and the architecture attempts to convey the glory of the Lord and the, the shepherd's reaction to it. From their initial fear to the delight, the absolute joy of finding the newborn Savior. To the end of the night when they are returning, glorifying and praising God for what they have seen and heard. Now, we, we need to take just a moment for a quick observation about Luke's writing in Greek. It's something very significant. He literally says that the shepherds were afraid with mega fear. Now, he, he, he uses a construction. It's uh, well, I call it a double phobia construction. Phobia is the Greek word for fear. He uses something that's not found anywhere else. He says they were afraid with great fear, afraid with mega fear. Look, five other places Luke talks about someone who's terrified. In each of those five other places, he uses a simple single word. It's almost like he reserves the double phobia construction, that phrase. He reserves it for the shepherd shock, the moment when, when these are the first ones to, to receive the good news. And, and, and then in the very next, because they, they go from mega fear in the very next instant to the angel saying to them, don't be afraid for I bring you good news of great joy, mega joy. Look, let's not be mistaken on this. Luke was a meticulous writer. He was very intentional. He is trying to make sure that we would see if we knew the language, his original readers would have seen this. He's trying to help them see that the shepherds go rapidly from mega fear to mega joy. From mega fear to mega joy and, and then on by the end of the night to glorifying and praising God for what God has been doing. God turns our worst fears into ultimate joy. What's your worst fear? Set it in front of God. He turns it into ultimate joy. Look, he does the same thing again when Jesus dies and is raised from the grave. Helps us to see that the fear of death, that it, is, it's, it, it becomes joy, resurrection. Death doesn't have any hold on us. Death is swallowed up in victory. Mega fears transformed into mega joy. God's in the business of doing that. Remember I said earlier that not all fears are created equal. And they aren't. Some are invalid, unnecessary, irrational, draining. But you know, Scripture refers to one fear that is helpful and wholesome above all others. One fear that is good above all others. It is the, it's a phrase that shows up more than a, a two dozen times, the fear of the Lord. 
which is a source of wisdom and, and faithfulness. I could show you so many beautiful examples of this, just two. One is in, in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23, the fear of the Lord is life indeed. Filled with it, one rests secure and suffers no harm. And then we hear that the early church, in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, we hear the church was thriving, living in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Now, this kind of fear is more of a wonder. It's a sense of awe. It's, a, it, it's, it's almost like being overwhelmed by the grandeur of, of, of God present with us. It's It's overwhelming. And it's the kind of thing that um, the, the, the fear of the Lord is, it, it's a sense of reverence for the majesty of God. Look, one of the ancient hymns that's now more than 1,600 years old captures this well. Likely you have sung it. Let all mortal flesh keep silent. And with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth descendeth, our full homage to demand. For centuries, this text and its predecessor in other languages has been sung in slow, chant like melody in a minor key to express a sense of reverence and awe for the incarnation mystery that we cannot possibly understand all the way. The fear and trembling is because the all-powerful transcendent God descends onto our landscape. Perhaps that describes, even more accurately, what was happening for the shepherds in the midst of their mega fear. Afraid of something radiantly mysterious and beyond their comprehension. The th y y y look, they knew where the stars should be in the night skies. They knew that. They were out there all the time. They could trace the jeweled patterns overhead. They had their own ordinary night after night sheep in the meadows routine. Then, one night, suddenly the glory of the Lord erupts over their gritty existence. The mundane becomes majestic, the humdrum bursts into the holy night. Let all mortal flesh keep silence and with fear and trembling stand. Of course the angel had to say, do not be afraid. Of course. And soon enough their mega fear became mega joy and then it became awe, and reverence, and wonder. Several weeks ago, I read a, a, a magnificent article by a pastor in Michigan. Here's a brief excerpt and, and a photo of his daughter that he used in the article. And he said, after Christmas Day 2004, my wife Kelly and I traveled with our first daughter to visit family in Florida since we were already in the Orlando area. I like this story already, don't you? We, we took her on her first trip to Disney World. She tagged along with infant curiosity through the various zones of the Magic Kingdom Puzzled at the oversized Winnie the Pooh character costumes, I don't recall all of her responses that trip, but I cannot forget one. We basked in the shadow of Cinderella's iconic castle until after dark and long after her regularly scheduled bedtime. And then the fireworks began. It's always a gamble to bring a child that young to an experience bordering on total sensory overload. She couldn't anticipate what was coming, but she gazed with perfect awe as the brilliant sparks showered down in the midnight sky 
At one point, I stopped watching the show altogether. I simply focused on her face instead, watching the fireworks mirrored in her tiny eyes. It's a snapshot of wonder, of mystical childlike innocence, frozen in time for me. And he suggested that so many of us lose our sense of wonder, which is why I love that hymn coming right into this message. I wonder as I wander. But so many lose the sense of awe and reverence for the dazzling life that's all around us, and especially for the Christmas message, the event, because we've seen it so many times. Oh, hum, we've just, it's old news now. Old news. Which is one of the reasons why the shepherds are so important in Luke's account. It's because with the shepherds, he shows us repeatedly, he shows us each year the awe and the reverence and the wonder that was there for those who first were seeing it and hearing about it on those hillsides. It's a snapshot of wonder, a biblical snapshot of wonder for all of us. Shepherds were not easily alarmed or disarmed by fear, but that nativity announcement got the best of them. And the shock of God's fireworks and the heavenly host triggered their mega fear, and they were eyewitnesses. But friends, it was, not, it was not an alien invasion. Unless you mean an invasion of divine love. It was not the war of the worlds. Unless you mean an epic battle between darkness and light, between sin and salvation. There's no existential threat. There's no clear and present danger. No need for a panic. Quite the opposite. It is an unprecedented arrival of joy. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. And it was good news of mega joy for all the people starting, starting with the shepherds. Yes, the love of God delivered in the fragile package of the infant Jesus is an absolute wonder. Make no mistake, Christmas is a wonder. God coming in this way is a wonder. And we still cannot, you and I still cannot comprehend all the wonders of his love. But we know enough. We know enough to know that we do not need to be afraid. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Over and over again, Lord, through your angels, through your messengers, you, you remind us, do not be afraid. And then Jesus keeps saying that to his disciples. Wow, that must mean you know how fearful we are. You know how we're prone to fear in a way that we don't even want to admit to ourselves. Well, we thank you that you, you give us this message. And even right there with, with Christmas, you keep saying to us, don't be afraid. And you want to change our mega fear into mega joy. Thank you. Help us to live in faith beyond our fears glorifying and praising you for all that we have seen and heard, like the shepherds. Amen. Uh...